Welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, created and hosted by Scott Knudsen, to explore the crossroads of horses and business. Now here's your host, Scott Knudsen. Hi, and welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're watching our podcast on one of our many platforms or listening to us on the radio in California on KCAA, the NBC affiliate, we want to thank you so much for listening and watching the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Today, we have part two with a very special guest, Dr. Harry Anderson, PhD, founder of Total Feeds and Total Human. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, for being on the show. It's great to be here. I enjoy these things. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, it was such a success on the first part. I appreciate you coming back. There was so many questions I wanted to ask you. We just didn't get time enough to do. Okay, well, I I hope I've got enough answers. (laughs) Well, I bet so. So we're going to ask a few more questions from part, uh, part one, and then we'll kind of move into part two. So part one. So growing up, you said you grew up in a one room house with a dirt floor. Would you mind I was, just letting? I was, born in, I was born. I was born there, and I spent my first two years in a one-room house. Oh my it goodness! It didn't have a wood floor, but that's about all. Wood floor. Oh my goodness! What? What? I know. At two years old, you don't remember probably a lot, but do you remember any stories about what it was like growing up in a one-room house and a rural environment? What? Well. well we were we were kind of different. My my parents all grew up in multi room houses. Uh, I love, my one of my grandmothers was born in a sod house in in North Dakota <laughs> in the eighteen nineties. So, so we go back to the same thing. We both started out the same. She she lived to be eighty some years old. So I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, you know. As as cold as it gets up there, what I think it gets cold, I don't know. I mean, it's tough. Just a tough deal. Well, yeah, I can get cold. Uh, the coldest I've ever been out in to work is minus fifty five, <laughs> with a minus ninety five wind chill. Oh my goodness! That'll set you on your ear and make you move <laughs> real quick. The chores get done quick. <laughs> oh my yes. goodness! So yeah, you so- can't be outside. Nothing can. No, that's just, that's tough. So how do you go from that to a PhD? I mean, that's, that's such a tall leap in just a few years. Well, um, it, it was simply by accident. Uh, (laughs) We, uh, as as I went through my education, I had no visions. I had no goals or anything, but these things kept popping up in front of me that uh, uh, opportunities that, I just uh, staggered into and finally ended up uh, in graduate school and, and earned a PhD in nutrition and several uh, several um, minors in biochemistry and physiology and pharmacology. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I got a nice well-rounded education almost by accident. And uh, I, I'd li- I like people to know that uh, when I graduated from uh, graduate school and I got my PhD, I had a son and a wife, and I owed thirty five hundred dollars in the world. We worked hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, so you say it's by accident. How do you have the discernment? Because in part one, we were talking about how you went to school; it was by accident, and how you worked for corporate; it was accident. Entrepreneur by accident. How do you have the discernment to recognize this is an opportunity I need to focus on? Because there's so many people right now. Maybe listener or watching, like, how does he know when to to uh, to do it, to do what they believe is right, to have that discernment? Well, I I don't know if I can give you a very defined answer on that, but uh, it just seemed to be that the things that uh, were people were doing at that time kept popping up, and giving me the opportunity to do those things. And and I did have a sister that one year older than me, and she uh, she went to college. So I figured I better go to college, and uh, she got a master's degree. So I figured, hey, she's just a girl. I can outdo her. <laughs> so I I go for a PhD without getting. Them. Oh, by the way, there's an interesting little wrinkle there too because uh, when you go to graduate school and want to get a PhD, you go and you get the you know, first 
two years, you work, basically you're a slave for the department doing little work and stuff and teaching and research and things. And they then they get you to do a master's degree. And uh, I got to looking and I said, I'm in a hurry here. So I went into my advisor and I said, I don't want to get a master's. I just want to go straight to a PhD. Oh, he said, we've never done that before. I said, well, I think we need to do it. And after about a 30 minute discussion, he said, okay, we'll, we'll try it with you. And we did. I went through without a master's, just went straight to the PhD and they've never done it since. I guess <laughs> always been a work. salesman. Yes. <laughs> I can be rather persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. The only one in history. So, so when you went from, from that and, and you did some jobs and you got in the corporate environment, and I know in part one you were talking about, it was just an accident. It's just something that happened. But how does something like that happen? Or how can somebody recognize, here's an opportunity, I better take it, because these opportunities <laughs> are rare. Well, in my case, it it, it boiled down to money, really. Mm. Uh, I, I was at the University of Wyoming for the first three years out of school. And even though I got the biggest raises in the Department of Agriculture, for some reason, they gave me bigger raises. Um, and uh, but I was now in today's terms, it wouldn't mean much, but I was clear up to twelve thousand dollars a year. <laughs> and a feed company came along and offered me a 50% increase in pay. Mm. I don't, I couldn't say no. I had no. two sons by that time. And uh, I, my wife, Margaret, uh, was not working anymore. I wanted her to raise the boys. And so I needed the money. Absolutely. And so it kind of pushed me into it. And uh, I'm glad it did. I'll never look back. I cherish those uh, those experiences. Each one of the things I did afterwards all have dovetailed into what I'm doing today. Everything I ever did along the way is part of what makes me successful, if if I can call myself successful uh, today in this environment. So, I, I so love I, it that. just it was luck. Somebody was watching out for me and kept directing me yeah. and throwing things down in front of me. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, but you had the fortitude to take it and do it, you know, pick them up and just run with it at, at, a, at a very high level. Yeah. You know, that, that, well, that's... that uh, I started to realize later in, in my career, my education and stuff, I started to realize the importance of looking for opportunities. Right. Uh, and not Absolutely. just, you know, flipping them by and walking by them. Uh, but I, I would, I, I like to do new things. Mm -hmm. Always have. Some people say I don't focus very well, that I'm always changing what I'm doing. And, and in this case, uh, through my lifetime, that's been good for many things. Sometimes it's not so great, but but it has been good because because I, I no matter what path I'm on, I'm always taking those rabbit trails. I took yeah. a lot of them on my la on the last show we did, uh, you know, on the little rabbit trails and talking about different things. I that's love the it. Way my, that's the way my mind works. Well, I, I love that. I think that's the only way you find more opportunity. If you just keep going down the straight road, you're going to see oh, just yeah. a few. And, and and I love how all the right. roads came back to what you're doing now. And, right. and, and there's a clear pattern. I, I love that. So so what what made you in your mind go from your mindset change from working for a corporation to being an entrepreneur? Well, that was again, almost, um, almost forced into it almost by accident because, uh, in the consulting world, the consultant is charged with taking care of the customer and doing the best thing for the customer. And, and I don't want to get into anything, uh, that, I shouldn't say here, but uh, it, it got to the point where where I was being criticized for doing things for my feedlot customers that were working great and very successful, but they had not been sanctioned by or researched by the company I was working for. And I got chastised for that. 
and to the point where one day I said, can't do this. My customers first. I don't care about the paycheck anymore. And that's when uh, when I walked away and became my own boss. Uh, of course, they never could boss me, but uh, <laughs> they discovered that early on. Uh, <laughs> I don't boss well. And and uh, so we parted company. I hung out my shingle in the year 1989 and became a private consulting nutritionist for basically the feedlot industry more than anything. I, I was consulting with the big mega yards, uh, those from, say, 15 or 20,000 up to over 100,000 head at a time. And uh, so I, I, I had enough business that wanted to stay with me when, when we parted company. So I had a good business base. And then over time, uh, that, and here again, it's my my concentration. I was doing so many things during that time, trying to to uh, show the world how flexible I was, I guess. I was doing uh, training uh, seminars for personality, public. Uh, I would analyze wow. people and do public seminars. And that that is part of the importance of what I'm, we're talking about today, uh, to tell show them how they make decisions, how they think, how they communicate, and how they differ from other people. And uh, I probably uh, tested well way over 4,000 people in the few years I did that. Oh and goodness. so then I use all of that expertise that I've gained from that in dealing with other people on how to communicate and how to, to get someone to see ideas. We all see them different. Right. We, uh, some some groups you have to show them a nice picture. I mean, right in front of them, or they don't see it. Others, I can I can explain it, uh, in I can describe it, and they draw their own picture in their mind. And you have to know which is which because you can offend either one of them real quick. <laughs> so I learned how I learned how not to do that. Uh, so that was one of my sidelines. My other one of my other sidelines was. I, I uh, did feedlot and nutritional training seminars for feedlot employees, feed companies. I actually had feed company nutritionists come to my seminars and nah. veterinarians would come to my seminars. And I got this, all of a sudden, this big head, you know, I said, wow, this could be good. Well, that runs out. You can only do that so long or so many, but that taught me a lot about what the industry was thinking. Mm -hmm. Very important to have that feedback of what competitors and so on were thinking. And so that was giving me a vision. This is where the vision comes from. And that's one of my, the when I talk to young people about being an entrepreneur, the first item is you have to have a vision of something. Love it. it you, you, even though you don't have goals, you have to have a, a vision that can make you excited. And that was where that was all developing over those years that I was doing that. And then I was involved with uh, several, and I, I learned some things from other companies, not not feed companies or anything, but um, one, of, one of the stories I wanted to tell today is uh, that kind of, I think, sums it all up. It In, in about 30 years ago, there was a somebody came to me. He was a, a retired pharmacology person in a pharmaceutical company, and he had this great idea. He had the idea of the animal behavior modifier. Nobody's heard of that because it went by the wayside, but it was a tail pinch phenomenon. He knew that if if you if you squeeze the the uh, spinal column of an animal, pressured it. Release pressure, release pressure, release. It releases endorphins in the brain, and it it also releases insulin into the body. Wow. I don't know why it does that, but I know it does. And and he had this apparatus that you would put on a cow's tail, and it would automatically it would it do that. And but think about this: Have you ever thought about how you would hold something on the tail of a cow? Mm -hmm. They're shaped the wrong way. They are. They get smaller as they go down, right? Right. <laughs> so what are you anchored to? We ended up with harnesses on them and everything else. <laughs> but, 
where I'm headed where I'm headed with this story, even though it was highly successful, I could make I could take this apparatus and I could make a cow uh, or a horse, either one, and I could still do it. I can put that on, and I don't care if they just ate and ate everything they wanted. I can make them eat again. It, it's that strong a desire. You can wow. use it on humans too, but nobody wants to do that. No. But the point I'm, I want to make is that this gentleman had no idea of how to start a company. So what he did, he gathered money from all his friends and family and everything. And he actually, he ended up with, uh, he ended up with about $12 million in that he gathered up. So he goes out and he does all this research at two, $300,000 a pop. And he did a whole bunch of trials and he traveled all over the world telling about this thing and he hired some people and he hired me as a consultant but uh, and on and on he ended up b burning 12 million dollars before he sold them before he sold anything oh no down the tubes gone uh, i worked with another outfit that came to me people would come to me see because they, they they do i could sell so they come to me to to help them promote another guy came with a with a bolus as a metal bolus about that big that you would drop well it's like uh, for hardware disease mm -hmm. you know you know you put a, a bolus down there and it gets into the reticulum and it lays there and it collects uh, this one would do the same thing but this magnetic bolus had a sensor in it that you could read body temperature from the outside wow and so you theoretically you could walk animals through the chute and you could pick out the ones that have an elevated temp and it was great technology Spent all his money, never sold one. And so it went by the wayside. And I thought to myself, when I started this company, I said, one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to spend ahead. And that's what they do. And that's what I, a lot of these startup companies do. They spend ahead. And they use, they use their capital before they sell the product. Mm -hmm. And that, that can't be done. Right. Because I made a kind of a list of things today that, that, uh, a sequence of events that should that should people should look at and follow this sequence if they would just do that instead of getting way ahead of themselves like most people do our our, our first uh impulse is to run out and advertise right sure of course that's but not what you do first right you, you sell something small quantities and and generate some capital because uh what what i and I've talked about the passion you have to have. You have to have a vision. You have to have a passion. Right. And then you need to figure out your skill set for what you want to do, where you where you think you're going to go. It doesn't Absolutely. matter where you're going or what you're going to do. You better think about your skill set. Can you sell? Do you have the background knowledge for it? And things right. like that. If you don't, you better go find those first. And you do those to get the company to pay for it, right? Absolutely. You learn by working for a company. Absolutely. And while you're working for that company, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you can be developing these, these ideas as you go along, but let them educate you, train you, and so on. And I shouldn't say that. That's maybe not a nice thing to, to look at it. Well, but that's what people have been doing for my lifetime. Absolutely. That's where a lot of these uh, uh, good companies come from. Uh, absolutely. I mean, then, if you're uh, doing the work and they're giving you a check, that's a fair trade. If you happen to learn something along the way and you apply it down the road, that's fair. And and I, I think it's a great that's, way that's to learn. True. You know, that's a great way yeah, to learn. You're not taking anything from the company. You 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 gave them what they paid for. A absolutely. But, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that that's one of the things that they have to have some backing on that. And then then they need to have adequate sor financial sources available. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have all the money to get started. You just have to have them so you can kind of reach out when you need some or, or have someone that will back you or you, you accumulate enough money to get get just a grub stake. You know, they used to call it a grub stake. Well, that's still what it is. <laughs> and then once you do that, you look at your market. What What is the market you're, you're wanting to go after? Is is there, is there a need for something different? Is there a need for something new? Because Scott, along the way, 
every time I've changed to doing something different, I have brought some new thinking and technology to that industry. Absolutely. Like the, the, the horse industry. Right. Uh, and I did it to the feedlot industry. I did it to the, all this stuff. Scott will be right back with more. Hi, I'm Scott Knutson, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Heard on KCAA, Fridays, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product. And we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to javacowboy.com. That's javacowboy.com. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code COWBOY on checkout. Remember, that's promo code COWBOY for an extra 10% off. Just go to javacowboy.com to order your coffee today. Total Equine. Total Bull. Total Canine. Total Goat. Total People Plus. Total Feeds. Unparalleled excellence in nutrition. One of the things that I brought to this party is that you can feed a horse with no hay or grass. Mm -hmm. Ask any nutritionist worth his salt out there how to start developing a, an equine diet. The rule is you feed one and a half percent of body weight as long stemmed hay to keep that gut working. And if you don't, they're going to get ulcers. They're going to colic. They're going to, there's a myriad of things that's going to happen to that horse before right. they die. Right. And you're going to kill them. Well, we changed that paradigm uh, in this one. And this was probably the biggest change I've made along the way is that we proved you can feed a horse out of a feed bag that has grain in it, that has hardly any fiber in it. And you feed about a third or a fourth of what you would feed if you're feeding nothing but hay of the volume. And they do phenomenally well. Horse has never been hurt. So that's the kind of thing you need to think about. What does that market need that's different, that could be unique? Right. Don't do, right. don't go into a market unless you have something unique. Yeah, no, don't copycat. You got to improve. The same as everybody else, what are you going to do? Sell it cheap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll go broke doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I know. I, well, it, it'll go along for a little while, but you only last so long. Yeah, that's and right. Then, then when you start, here, here's what I think is a real important point. When you start, you, you make a small quantity of whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then you go out and sell it. And you don't come home till you sell it. And you sell it and you make a little money. Now you go make some more, but you have that little profit. Now you can do a little advertising or promotion. Right. And and you do then you get some more a bigger quantity and you sell it, you come home and you do, you spend some more on advertising. You don't spend what your base money was on advertising before you sell. Makes I've watched sense. that happen, like I, I described, I've watched that happen too many times. So <sighs> so you use that profit and you spend that profit. You, now you have to you have to skimp a little on your keeping the profit for yourself for a while. That's all right, you know, 
suffer a little early on for long term gain. Yeah, absolutely. That's the old saying. Absolutely. And and then uh, as you grow, you just get more operating money and and more sales, and and it starts to mushroom. Uh, we started uh, the the first year. I quit, actually quit uh, uh, consulting. We had about uh, half a million dollars in sales. I thought, wow, that, yeah, and that's good. But on a half a million, within the feed business, you don't make a lot of profit because it, it's mostly ingredients, as you right. probably know. Yes. The, the profit uh, structure is not big in the feed bin. You have to do lots and lots of volume to make much money. But so, but I got a hold of some things I got on TV about that time uh, and wrangled myself uh, free TV time. <laughs> that was good. Only and, you. Uh, all this... <laughs> you don't know how to do that stuff. Absolutely. And, and I got got a couple other shows on, on that started on TV that I was supporting. And got got through there that way, and and then all of a sudden people started coming and they started knowing me and started buying and so my volume started going up and up and up and I was I doubling my sales every year for I forget about five or six years, I doubled it every year. Incredible. And then of course it had to slow down and it's it's gotten much slower than that, but still we went from a very small uh, part of the market to uh, what I think is a pretty good sized part of it. Nothing like the big boys. I'll never be like the big boys. You don't have to be to make a living. Right. Um, right. Cause uh, they have things, they have things they have to do that I don't. Right. And that's pay middle managers and marketing people, and blah, 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 you know, just gross expense that they pay. Uh, we, we avoided that. So then after you get, or you're doing well, then you have to start thinking about what we've gone through in the last two, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Corey's been a big part of this. Eric's been a big part of this. Uh, how how we distribute. Uh, Eric has worked great with uh, trucking and stuff to keep that in line. But Corey has been working on the other side with the marketing. And we've had to change our marketing structure. And right. that's not just for COVID. I mean, people think, well, you had to do all that for COVID. That's not just for COVID. The signs were coming already anyway. Mm -hmm. TV was going away as far as the major part of our advertising. It mm -hmm. had to be social media. Uh, so all of a sudden, here we are. We're, we're getting involved with like podcasts. Uh, we've done some with other people. Uh, they've been great. And um, the social media hitting the uh, oh Snapchat. I don't even know who they are. Snapchat and all those. You probably know better than I do. That uh, I just I've know heard they're of out them. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doing anywhere from six to twelve or second spots, and we're getting responses from that. Yes. I used to do lectures. You know, think you had to do a thirty-minute lecture to get your point across. Uh huh. Not to these young people. No. They they, uh, they pick up tidbits and then they follow if they want to. They'll learn they'll learn more when when and if they want to. Uh, all you have to do is stimulate that brain. And you right. you've got when they're looking at their phone, you've got about six to ten seconds to do it. That's been a tough one for me. That's the tough but one. I think young that's... people probably understand that better than I do. But but that's kind of a sequence of events that People need to think about, and you can't jump over those steps and, right. and be successful. That's why I think the states still are that 90% of all startup companies don't make it past the first 12 months. Mm. That's sad. It, it's so it's sad. Because they violated a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think fast. it helps so much by you telling how to do it, and, and it's proven that you've done it. And, and if they listen and take notes, it's so important just to learn yeah. from other people that are successful. A absolutely. Right. And yeah. you were talking and about your two sons I'd have a part of the company, with, sir. Yeah. I, I love to share it with young people because uh, absolutely. I know a lot of good, very savvy young people that are going to 
going to want to go this way. Absolutely. And, so and there's I, people in corporate America, too. You know, there's people yeah. in corporate America that want to do what you did and leave and, and, and start their own business. And they can't skip yeah. steps. So you can't skip. Thank you for listening to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Scott will be right back with more. For more information on Scott Knudsen, the Cowboy Entrepreneur, visit us online at cowboyentrepreneur.com. Hi, I'm Scott Knudsen, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Heard on KCAA, Fridays, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product. And we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to javacowboy.com. That's javacowboy.com. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code COWBOY on checkout. Remember, that's promo code COWBOY for an extra 10% off. Just go to javacowboy.com to order your coffee today. Total Equine. Total Bull. Total Canine. Total Goat. Total People Plus. Total Feeds. Unparalleled excellence in nutrition. So, and, and thank you for sharing that. This, that's so helpful for people to understand. You know, it, it's, a, it's a ladder ride up to get to a certain level in a company or a business. And you don't skip the right. rung or, or you're going to fall. <clears throat> Yeah, um, you can you can do well in a company if you stay with them long enough and you move up the corporate ladder up and up and up. But uh -huh. all they have to do is change one person above you that doesn't absolutely. care for you. Bing, 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 down you go again. So, absolutely. So there's no there's no guarantee in a company. Right. I learned that early on. A absolutely. Absolutely. What well, do you think it made but you learned, like, sir? I learned for, what I took away probably from uh, corporate America. I got to work with some of the best salespeople that I still have ever known. Love and it. they were the old country salesmen that knew how to talk to people and knew how to service people. And that's what I've modeled myself from ever since. I can mimic several of them. And sometimes I catch myself mimicking some of them and how they operated. <laughs> I, I that, love that. What well, was it relationship? Yes. Or was it relationship it, or was relationship it knowledge? Telling. Yeah, absolutely. I love yeah. that so much. Yeah. I used to teach sales schools too. <laughs> Did you really? Way. Awesome. Oh yeah. I used to teach sales, sales people how to sell. <laughs> <laughs> the right way. Oh, I've, had, I've had more fun than I deserve. <laughs> oh, so, so relationship selling. So can you tell us, would you mind just sharing a little bit of knowledge on that? What does that mean? Relationship selling. Well, relationship selling to me is very simple. You don't, you don't always have to know the person real well. I think one of the critical things about meeting someone that you've not met before Find out where they're from and said, well, how's the family? Yeah. Can, can anybody not feel comfortable if you want to know about the family? And then 
then the important thing is stop and listen. <laughs> there, that's a I've kicker. Had people say that and then go right on. No, no. Right. You listen. That may take a little time sometimes, and sometimes it can take a lot of time. But but they feel good about knowing you, and they start to trust you if you share experiences about the family, even though you've never seen each other before. That doesn't matter. You're still you're still friends, Absolutely. and and you want you want them to be a, look at you as a friend that's wanting to help them. And that, that's kind of how you do it. Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes I've seen salesmen make and it, it drives me crazy. It's probably not time to talk about all that today, but, but uh, that, that's kind of a whole, whole sequence of events in itself. Uh, but uh, that, yeah, relationship selling is still, still the best way. Still the best. I've seen I, sales I, reps. I, I still talk run into s- that where I run into somebody that doesn't want to know me. Uh, I almost have to turn and walk away, right? Because I know they're not listening. Right. Uh, when when they start with an argument or they start with a challenge, it, you know, I don't right. do well there. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. I want to be friends. Uh, why not? You know, why not? I mean, it's a vested interest. Yeah. You know, the better they do, the better we'll do, or you'll right. do. You know, it just kind of goes in. Yeah. I've seen sales reps talk themselves out of a sales job too out of an opportunity to sell something. Oh, they just keep talking. A point. That's a great point. I have seen so many salesmen talk themselves right through a, a sale and then go off out the other end and walk away and say, didn't get anywhere there. Well, <laughs> you would have shut up about halfway through. Yes. I didn't say that. But if you, that's what I wanted to say. Absolutely. I, I want you know, because I used to go out with salesmen. When I was consulting you know, with, when I was with the company, I, they salesman would take me out and stand me up in front of, you know, the feedlot manager or somebody, and and, and that they, I'd, I'd have to do the, do the, technical work and all the fancy words, the PhD words and all that kind of stuff. Sure. But they were going to close the sale, and they talk and talk and talk, and all of a sudden, you know, I could see this, customer pr- prospect. You know, getting up and you know, close and yeah, they're. I think they're ready. And then they tell a story, and he goes, mm. "I knew. Let's go. Let's go home. <laughs> we'll come back another time, or maybe I'll circle around and I'll do it for you." <laughs> yeah, that that probably be the better way to do it. Oh my yeah. goodness! <laughs> Isn't it funny though when someone's trying? They're trying too hard to be good at something like that, like selling. When really right. selling is just listening. And you listen, you find that opportunity, and you fix that problem. Kind of like an entrepreneur. Right. right. Oh, yeah. Same yeah. thing. So, yeah. so being an entrepreneur, you said earlier in the show that it was hard to boss you. You weren't good at having a boss. Do you think that made you better as an entrepreneur, that now it's your own, your own ideas and you can carry them through because you have that vision? Yeah. I, I, I have, I've always been to where I had to get away from somebody trying to be bossy to me. Right. Um, I didn't grow up being bossed around. Um, oh, times there were, but I always got away with it, you know, because <laughs> I was a very independent kid. Um, right. And uh, I'd, I'd sneak away, take the family car when I was 13 and go to country dances. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I could still get in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they'll come looking for you tonight. Of course, people who were in authority then, they're probably gone. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my we, goodness, we had we had some some uh, exciting time. Oh, you know, Elizabeth asked me last to have a story, and and you asked me last time if I she asked me if I had a funny story. Okay, I had one that I I really liked to tell. It was back in the old days when I was still consulting and traveling from Texas to Kansas, back and forth, Montana. So. One day, one uh, evening, I was coming back out of Texas. I was headed for home in Kansas, but I had to make a stop the next morning in, in Oklahoma. So I was going through Jacksboro, Texas. You know where Jacksboro is? That's kind of a rural America. Yes, and, sir. Uh, I was just coming up on the edge of town. I thought, you know, I'm, maybe I'll just shut her down. And here was the Jacksboro Motel, a little motel that's, you know, a L-shaped motel, you know, one story and about 10 rooms and everything. So I pulled my big trailer in on the far side of the 
the parking lot, check in. Next morning, I get up five o'clock in the morning to get get on the road early, and there wasn't a light anywhere. I thought, my gosh, my trailer's still on the other side of the parking lot. I think I can find it. I can kind of see some things. So I, I took my my first luggage and I took it over to the trailer, but I left my door open with the light so I could see where I was coming back to. So I got my stuff in the trailer and, and I was coming back. And just as I was coming between the cars, I saw something move along the sidewalk, along the wall. It was black with white stripes. Oh, there was a skunk paddling along. <laughs> just he'd, he'd seen the light of my room. And I thought, oh, you're kidding me. This can't be happening. Sure enough, in he goes. I'm standing out there between the cars watching this, and he walks over to the sink, and he's looking around. How am I going to get my computer out of there? My Part of my luggage is still in there. So I stood there a moment. He walked back and then walked over by the bed under the little nightstand. And so my computer was over by the where he'd been standing. So I walk in, I go, <laughs> tiptoeing across through there, you know that. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I pick up my computer, my day planner, and I turn around like this, and all of a sudden, he's coming out be- from behind the bed, and he oh. stops and he goes, looks me right in the face. I thought, here's the end of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and trouble. He paddled, he paddled outside the door, and you could smell that he'd been in there. <laughs> and I was with so much wanted to know what the cleaning person was going to say. <laughs> but that's one of the uh, one of the more exciting things that happened to me while I was traveling. I've got piles of those, but that that's the best one. <laughs> oh, I love road stories. You know, I love it. <laughs> you, you, you just still, I mean, whoever it was is still telling that story. I went into his room oh, yeah, and it yeah. smelled like a skunk. Yeah, there was some dude came through here with that trailer and he had a skunk with him. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So uh, so, so you have a family business and we were talking about it and you mentioned your two sons a little bit earlier and your wife is involved in it. Right. So how? So there's so many family businesses, you know, large scale like you and some smaller ones. How do you work that dynamic? So everybody kind of has their role and it still works out. Um for for the good of the family, number one, and the company. We're we're extremely fortunate in the fact that uh, of the four people, Margaret, myself, and the two guy sons, are all different. Uh, we we each have our own expertise. Margaret is a master at communication. She has a degree in education. She's very good at communicating and helps all of us. <laughs> as best she can <laughs> with, with our communication skills. Right. Uh, of course, I have the technical background and that in inbred, that, that salesmanship that, that I've developed over time. They do not. Mm-hmm. But Eric is ex-military. He was in, he was the first unit over in Desert Storm and the last unit back. Wow. And so he has that military background that stayed with him. I think he had that before he went in, mm-hmm. um, but he has that military. So he takes care of our logistics. You don't fool Makes with him. Uh, don't make a promise and then truck drops off. It doesn't work. <laughs> and so he takes care of that. Uh, very good at. It. And then Corey is a he's he's the creative one. He has he has a uh, a degree, a bachelor's degree in psychology from University of Kansas. Do you know oh, what good. you do with a four-year degree in psychology? Uh, tell me. Not a whole Please. lot. <laughs> but, but but it's useful, very useful for what he does. Mm-hmm. For us. He he can understand and he he goes after the uh, the mentality or if you want or or what people are thinking and he he's he's very into this changing role of our marketing. Because he understands how the young people are thinking. And your daughter-in-law's in the business. Yes. Uh, Cynthia came on when, when Margaret, uh, she retired. And uh, she wanted to 
do other things. So I, I, I let her and no, just kidding. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so Cynthia, uh, Eric's wife picked up and started doing the, the mailing of all the things, you know, and, and our mail orders, because we do a lot of mail order stuff. Uh, most of her, half of our total people plus is all mail order. Wow. And so she takes care of that banners, brochures, etc. So that's her role. But uh, the other thing is that we can have all the expertise that any big company has piecemeal. We have a, a uh, an accountant that we had worked with privately for several years. And all of a sudden we uh, got super busy. So I said, well, can you take over inputting invoices from feed companies and do the billing out to the customers? And she said, yeah, and she can do it in a fraction of the time that I can do it. Right. And we pay her a modest amount every month. And uh, it takes that away from me, which so that takes one piece out of the puzzle. Then then the social media or that those kinds of contacts are monitoring social media to see who's who's talking about us out there and what they're saying, what are our endorsees putting out there for, et cetera. We need to know that. Well, she's on there every day. And so we buy part of her time. And so we have all that expertise that would take a whole department in another company. It's one yeah, person. Absolutely. And then as far as uh, oh, our uh, you know, video work and things like that, uh, we have one of the best videographers that I know of. He, he does that part-time. When we need him, we call him. He comes and does it. And then and our social media lady, she has uh, it. Actually, she has her own little company called Calamity Media. And uh, she has four girls that work with her that can carry cameras and do a great job of that. So when we go to a function like when we go to the NFR. We have Ben, our videographer, Sadie, four of her girls, all with cameras running all over Las Vegas, getting material for us. We gather enough material there almost to support us for us the rest of the year. Isn't that amazing? It, it, it costs quite a bit in for a couple of weeks, but that's all we spend for the year. So uh, that's how we get all the expertise of the biggest company in the world, but it doesn't cost us very much at all. I, I love that. So it's so creative, but you're also hiring other entrepreneurs. Everybody you named is an entrepreneur that's helping you build your business. Absolutely, because they each have their own business. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I love what you said earlier. Somebody's not bad with the way the business is run and they have to look in the mirror because it's their business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that has stuck with me That's since right. the last show. I love that. <laughs> and I love how you help other entrepreneurs and, and uh, run around Vegas to get there's so much to see in Vegas. And y'all are really a part of the event and the PBR for sure. Yes. Right. Yeah. And here in in a couple of weeks, we're going to spend a week with uh, with the ranch sorting people, the national finals. Very cool. And we'll be doing the same thing. You know, we we uh, help them with uh, we uh, feed. You know, we feed out. We put a live live feed out for them. On um, put cameras all over Fort Worth. I mean, uh, Will Rogers, and uh, do a live feed. And uh, we'll capture piles and piles of stuff there in one week. We don't have to be traveling all the time all over the country to do this. They come to us, really. I love that. I love that. So you're on the road at some of these bigger events. Do you still do your keynotes or, or other events like that where you're out and about? We, yes, we, uh, like I'll be doing the, the uh, mounted shooting finals, and that's concurrent with the ranch sorting finals. But we do the BFI, we do uh, the World Series of Roping, uh, the uh, USTRC Roping. Uh, mm -hmm. We're the biggest sponsor, feed sponsor for that. We're the feed sponsor for all these things. And so all these people gather up for us. And, and we can go and, and harvest a bunch of stuff out of there. And uh, they enjoy seeing us, and we, we get whoever we want to pull out. Uh, it's just an efficient way of doing it. And, and that goes into all of those 500 plus uh, videos we have on YouTube, right. as well as all of our Snapchat and all those little ditty bobs 
Uh, we get that's where we harvest them, get them. So it's just a it's just an easy, fun way to do it. And I get to spend more time at home than I've ever spent. Isn't that amazing? I, just doing it more efficiently. But when you go out, it's for a bigger yes. impact. I love that. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, People still uh, want to see see you. They sure. still want to shake your hand. They still want to know you're a real person. Right. Even though they see my picture on every feed bag they pick up. Yeah, absolutely. But they want to know, they want to say I met him or I talked to him. Or, I shook yeah. his hand because that. Right. Once again, relationship selling. And then 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 I get to heart, uh, stories like this. Uh, I had a I had a call yesterday. Well, yeah, yesterday from a guy in South Texas that said, uh, yeah, I've been using your total people for 15 years. I got to tell you a story. And he said, remember my, remember my, our conversation? Oh yeah. 15 years ago. I remember every one of them, <laughs> but he said, I sent you a picture of this whole horse that I rescued. And then I sent you a picture of him for 59 days later. And he looked, went from a skeleton to look like a racehorse. And he said, my buddies all said, when they saw that, they said, can I come and live with you for 60 days? <laughs> and, but, but he said, oh, well, what I want to tell you, he said, 15 years ago, I had a shoulder bone on bone and the doctor said, we're going to do surgery. He said, I started taking total people plus. He said, I'm still waiting on the surgery. Wow. Those are, and what he really called me about was he got, had a couple of bucket bulls he wants to, to grow up and he wanted to know how to feed them. That's just fine. But he had to tell me these stories. And if we go to shows, we get a lot of those people coming by and say, I just got to tell you, <laughs> when they say those words, I'm ready. <laughs> My ears perk up. <laughs> I love that. I love that. How did you go down that road to total people? Just real quick, I'm watching the time here, but so you so you're in the horse feed business. By request, to, just by request. By request, somebody requested that uh, that I, I take care of them like I do their animals, and I said wow. sure. What a compliment! So I took, uh, yeah, I just took the uh, micro package out of the total equine to, at that time and put it in a capsule. It's it's exactly what the horses get. It just doesn't have the hay and grain in it. Wow. So every, every formula I have has that exactly exact same micro package in it. And that's what that's what does the work. It's not it's not the alfalfa and it's not the grain and those kinds of things that are the are the important part of my my programs. I mean, I, lo I love that. It's such a like I said, a compliment for someone to come up. Man, you made my horse look good. You know, can you help me now? You know, it's so cool. Yeah. Um, and, and, but you did it. You listened to your customer and uh, yeah. everything I've, everything I've done has been because of a request. Really? I, I didn't make any of these products that I have, the total goat, the total bull, total canine or any of those until somebody asked me for them. So your customer <laughs> kind of leads your business, but you figure out the way to run it. That's right. I love that. I love, it sounds so simple. simple, you know, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a trust an issue for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, it was just so much knowledge and I know everybody loved it. And please thank your son, Eric, for his service. You bet. All right. Thank I you appreciate be being on here and we'll do it anytime you want. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you to all the great sponsors of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. If you or your business is interested in being a sponsor of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, please call our office at 830-992-1786 or visit our website, cowboyentrepreneur.com. Hi, I'm Scott Knudsen, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Heard on KCAA, Fridays, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. 
We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product. And we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to javacowboy.com. That's javacowboy.com. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code COWBOY on checkout. Remember, that's promo code COWBOY for an extra 10% off. Just go to javacowboy.com to order your coffee today.